why I appreciate being here because if it were not snowing and if the soil was dry, you all would be out yeah. in the garden because that's where I'd be. So I probably would have called them and said, hey, I can't be there. I'm feeling kind of sick today uh, because we're all anxious to get out. And right now it just is, uh, it's miserable. The soil is wet, too wet to do any kind of gardening. And the, the most important thing is wait till the soil dries out. It just dawned on me, Carol Kennard, does that name sound familiar? Yes. Carol Kennard, what an incredible person. Carol is our Parks District Director, and I am the Commissioner of the Park, or the President of the Parks District, and she has done an incredible job out in retirement bringing us in terms of our park district and where we were to where we are today. So you guys had a great person working here and she's working now with us. Probably going to be retiring soon again, uh, but it's just been a real pleasure working with her. What a great lady. So I just, it just dawned on me about that. So I'm glad to, glad to be here again today. So we're going to talk about annuals and this is going to be a bit of a problem for me. And the gentleman who's doing the recording, I, I've bugged him all morning to make sure I get this set up right. Um, if I do wrong and get too far, he's going to tell me to get back. i got to stay right here. I'm not one to be tethered. Um, I move a lot, I talk a lot, and uh, it, being back here is going to be a challenge, but we're going to make it work. As you said, I'm a problem solver, so I'll, I'll try to solve that problem. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cultivar trials. How many of you are familiar with cultivar trials? How many of you have seen our cultivar trials in Springfield? Excellent, excellent. We have cultivar trials at the Snyder Park Gardens and Arboretum. The mayor said some good things are happening in Springfield, and indeed they are. Our master gardener volunteers have kind of taken over the former Snyder Park golf course, and we were asked to put our gardens there, so we've been developing about 53 acres of that. Now, we aren't doing 53 acres of gardens by any means. We are basically doing different theme gardens within that 53 acres, and there will be sidewalks where you can walk from each garden, but there are a lot of grass, a lot of green space. So the cultivar trials are there. I'm a huge proponent of trialing plants before they go to market, and the majority of the plants that you're going to see today are, have been trialed, are in trials at the company sites, Ball C Company, Proven Winners. You can bet they don't put anything out on the market until it's really proven or it's really good. They are going to make sure those plants are good before they go. But the final step is to get them into the consumer's hands to see the trials. So universities across the country will charge entries and they pay a, a fee to put their plants in our trials. And then we look at them, we evaluate them, and we give them that information back to use for marketing or other purposes that they may use them for. So what we're looking for in our trial process is those plants that do really well under very limited inputs, meaning no deadheading, very little fertilizing, very little care is given to them. And if that's the case, they're going to get really good, good numbers rather. We're also an all-American trial selection garden. How many of you are fam familiar with the AAS trials? Okay. This is a nonprofit organization that actually does trialing across the country, and it is called a comparison trial. So basically, the breeder who really likes this per certain plant says, you know what, I've got this marigold, and it is better than all the marigolds out there on the market today. So he pays an entry fee, like around four or $500. It goes into the trials. He also says, well, it's comparable to these two other kinds of marigolds. So those are put in the trial. And as a judge, I evaluate this one compared to the ones that are on the market. If we come across something that is really good and we give it high numbers, high recommendations all season, then it becomes an All-American selection and it'll be a gold medal winner. Of course, the gold medal winner then, the breeder, the grower, the distributors, they can promote that as an award-winning plant. So we're the only uh, site in Ohio that is one of the actual trial sites for All-American selections. Now, in our trials, we are doing just a, a group of six and we go one to five, how good are they? We're not doing comparison trials. The master gardeners of Clark County are involved in the trialing process. They help with planting. In fact, right now they're in the greenhouse. They're planting everything up. We will have them planted out into the gardens about the middle of May. Today I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of plants. We're going to go through them rather quickly. Somebody said I could be here three to four hours, so if you want to sit around and we'll talk all day about plants, we can do that. Uh, but if I don't tell you specifically 
that the plants were grown in shade, you can assume that they were grown in sun. Because this is our shade plot. We do have some that are entered to grow into the shade. You can guarantee this is heavy shade, or I can guarantee, because this is a Norway maple tree. Heavy, dense shade. So if they do well in the shade, it would be in this type of situation. I'm also responsible for the trials on campus at the Chadwick Arboretum and Learning Gardens. And in Chadwick, we do a little bit different method. Now, you might ask, why is she spending so much time on this method when we want to you know, get to the plants? We want to see the plants. Well, it's important when you're looking at trial data because you need to know the method for trialing. Were they fertilized? How often were they watered? Were they mulched? Were they deadheaded? What was the process involved? In Springfield, we do everything on a very limited basis. One fertilizer, no mulch, no deadheading. In Chadwick, on campus, we fertilize, we use mulch, which of course improves the soil over the years, and we deadhead as well. And I will show you some of the differences that you might see in those processes. But overall, I have to tell you, most of our plants today, the vegetative cuttings are superior. And the reason I say these are not your grandma's annuals is because I remember grandma's annuals, the purple and white petunias in front of her house that we would go out and deadhead. We had to deadhead them or they wouldn't bloom anymore. And they were slimy and they smelled. Petunias still are slimy and smell, but you don't have to deadhead them today, some of the new varieties. Uh, we plant these in a rich, loamy, well-drained soil. We till it to 14 inches. So we basically do the preparation that a homeowner or a, a backyard gardener commercial planting might do. We plant six plants per cultivar per, per variety. So you can see if you're looking here at these plants, there's six of each plant in a block. That's what we're evaluating. We give that a rating based on the performance of that plant. We fertilize one time in Springfield. Triple 14, a slow release fertilizer. Of course, this is based on a soil test, right? We all do soil tests, um, or we should at least do one. I can see people saying, oh, no, I don't do one. I've never done it. Do at least one. Just recommend one soil test so you know what your baseline is. Uh, we have this little fancy tube that we put together because volunteers were leaning over, bending down, putting a tablespoon in each hole. That just makes it go faster for us. At Chadwick, we irrigate on a regular basis. So we give it basically what it needs. One inch per week is what most plants are going to be now doing their best with in terms of performance. Clark County, we irrigate when necessary. If we didn't irrigate at times, we wouldn't have any plants to evaluate. So we have to make some irrigation uh, choices at times. We do not deadhead at Snyder Park Gardens in Arboretum. And we also don't use any pesticides, mulch, additional fertilizer now. I do want to tell you this, at the bottom you see that little asterisk, unless absolutely necessary. So if something comes up, and let's say we have deer at times, or we have Japanese beetles, if we decide that if we don't do something, then those plants aren't going to make it through the trial. So if that's the case, we will take action, and I'll tell you about a couple of the plants that we do use some products on. Uh, but if we have to, we'll use them, but basically we don't. We regularly deadhead at Chadwick Arboretum Learning Gardens. Again, we don't use pesticide unless it's absolutely necessary. We do mulch. So as I mentioned, mulching is good for the soil. As it breaks down, it adds that organic matter. So this is why you see two different results at times for a certain species of plants. You can go to this website, go.osu.edu slash Clark Cultivar Trials. That is where we have our monthly evaluation data and our final research report. And you can see we do a once a month evaluation. All of the volunteers that participate in it, we average that all together to get us a final number. And that final number is basically the plants that I'm sharing with you today, the ones that have done really well throughout the entire season. Um, so you can, you can get that rating, you can get that website or that um, final research report right there. If we were really good, we would have pictures on there, but that's just one thing we have not been able to keep up with. As you can imagine, we're doing over 260 some varieties at two different sites. So keeping up with pictures is, is not something we can do right now. So we're gonna go through the plants that have performed the best for about the next 45 minutes to 50 minutes. And then if there's questions, we will uh, answer those questions towards the end. Alternanthera, 
How many of you have been to Kings Island, Cedar Point, and you see those really cool clock designs, you know, where they have the plants that make up the clock and the ones and all that? Well, Alternanthera is the plant that they use, but those older ones, ruby, I think it's ruby threads and gold threads, those were the ones that they used. Varieties today are much, much more improved. This is one called Root Purple Prince. Very short, very compact, uh, close to the ground. Excellent for a ground cover, but I would prefer to see it like in a container or maybe even as a border plant. It's a beautiful, rich, dark burgundy all season long, and it doesn't fade out during the course of the season. There's a close-up shot of really nice foliage. Now, Alternanthera are those plants that love heat absolutely love heat and they love it hot and dry. You can see in this situation the soil's dry and cracked and they're thriving. Alternanthera will rot out if it gets wet, if the soil is wet and it gets too hot and wet. So it, it's definitely one of those plants that loves dry areas. Mixing it with something such as a lighter color like the zinnias here or the pink petunias, yellows, it definitely needs something to make it stand out. And by the way, anytime you're designing beds or pots, a little bit of white makes everything else much brighter. So you know, add some white to the beds, add some white to the containers, just to make all the other colors stand out. Okay, begonias. There's some pretty cool begonias on the market. Um, this is a hybrid that's uh, the Rivulet series. And when I say series, that's the name or the group of plants that do really well, all the same habits and so forth, but just different colors. So this is orange blush, orange blush, double and red. Begonias are a little tender. As you know, if you've had begonias, they break very easily. So if you kind of walk by them or a basketball drops on them, they will break. And um, they need to be kind of in a protected place. They do much better in shade. These are excellent for containers and hanging baskets and they are very vigorous. Some of the older varieties would take a long time to grow during the summer. These are very quick to grow with these beautiful pendulous orange flowers um, that, are, that are very noticeable. So they're excellent for a container. Now, series that I really like. Some of you might remember years ago um, when we used to sell begonia uh, vodka, whiskey, and gin. Does anybody remember those begonias? If you are, you're as old as I am, or possibly older. Those were really small. I mean, really, you know, just very little begonias. They didn't have any size or height to them. They were nice. I mean, they had a suitable place in the shade, but they just weren't like you see today. Big Whopper and Megawatt are three series that are absolutely incredible. Size, height, I know I heard somebody say, wow, these are definitely a wow. Now, they're still brittle. Begonias are brittle by nature, so you're still gonna have that, you don't put them by the basketball court. But this is six, six, one, two, three, four, five, six different cultivars together. Full sun, the amount of color that you get in full sun is just amazing. Two, two and a half feet tall, they're bigger, they're bolder, and they make great mass plantings. And again, in full sun, they don't fade out, they don't scorch, they look really good throughout the growing season. One of the things that we learned, and this was kind of interesting, that was the same bed. This is the same bed you see here. Uh, at the end of a growing season, we got eaten up by deer. I mean, they just came in and, and basically all they did was kind of strip the top. They left all the foliage here. They didn't really eat them. They just tried them and dropped them because they just apparently didn't taste that good. But they came in and, and all season, they didn't bother them. But when they got to the end of that season, boy, I was shocked to see that I never knew that begonias were tasty for deer. This is a really cool one. This is a, a Rieger begonia called Gryphon. And it's really cool, but it's really big. Three to four feet by three to four feet. I used to have some of these um, on pots in the front porch. You know, you're, you've got an entryway, you've got a little window on this side, a little window on this side, maybe the door's, what, four foot? When I had those there, my husband threatened that we had to use a machete to get in the house because I'm not, they covered almost the entire porch. So they are good for a very, a very large area. Uh, they have beautiful red, deep red venation, very cut leaves, and really beautiful red stems. So there is a place for them. However, what I would suggest is looking at one called Pegasus. Same look, same appearance, but much smaller and much more maintained. So it's easier to grow and I think it's one that a homeowner would use. Now, this next group. If you don't like these, then you don't like plants very well. 
Um, I was, we were so excited last year. These are the Rex begonias. They're again, they're crosses, they're hybrids. And last year, Ball Seeds sent these in. And when they came in, they send us the stuff like they're shipping right now in plugs, little plugs that we take out of the trays and plant in four inch pots. These things were beautiful. Everybody was like, oh my goodness, those are just, you know, they were coveted, let's just say. At the end of the season, when we plant everything out in the fields, we have leftovers. And all the leftovers are distributed among the volunteers who helped in the greenhouses and who helped plant these. So when they saw these, everybody was like, I'm going to get that one. I'm going to get that one. We had to actually limit the number of plants that they could take of these because they're just incredible. Um, this is the series. This is one of them. This is Jurassic Megalo Reptile. Just absolutely fun. And pictures don't really do these justice because when you see them up close, the colors are rich. They're different. They're deep. Um, you might know of one called Escargot, very similar to the one called Escargot. <laughs> Here's a, a bunch of them right here. Um, of course, I took a few extra that I could scarf out. Uh, reptile, Dino polka dot, croc, red splash. The colors are just incredible. Now they are begonias and they are tuberous. So they do form tubers. So if you're really good, you can bring them in, put them in the house and grow them during the winter. I, of course, am not very good at that because mine are all dead, both inside and outside. But you could save them and grow them over again, or you could bring them in and grow them as a house plant. They've got another whole grouping of them coming out this year, new introduction. So it's just, they're just fabulous. They don't really bloom. They do have a really teeny tiny, you can see right here, just a little bit of a bloom, but they're not known for their blooms. They're known for their foliage. Bracteantha, do you remember the old straw flowers? really old straw flowers that we used to use, the, you know, the pinks and the whites. They're good cut flowers, great dried flowers. This is a new one by Suntory called Granvia Gold. Huge 50 cent piece flowers that are great for drying and they're great for preserving. In fact, I took some at the end of the season before a hard frost and I, I thought, well, I'll save these and hang them up and dry them. And, put them in a bucket, never got around to drying them. And about two, three weeks ago when I was cleaning out the garage, getting ready for spring, I pulled stuff off the top of them and they still were this yellow color. They hadn't faded, a little crushed, but they looked great. So it's a great long lasting dry flower. They're also called everlastings. So they do last a long time. Now, this one is in Springfield. This one is in Columbus. If you see this plant right there, you see a little brown, they don't necessarily need deadhead, but they look better if you do. Um, as they start to die out, they become really noticeable. They still continue to bloom and cover up those, but the noticeableness, is that a word? They are very noticeable in the garden. They turn brown. So it's easier, I think, to deadhead them and keep them looking like this. Okay, celosias. Uh, again, the old celosias that we used to have, they were good plants, good colors. The new celosias and even some of the older ones, one called Arabona Red, beautiful colors, beautiful displays that are really uh, cool that people like them because they've got this really feathery growth. Typically with the old celosias, if you didn't deadhead them, they wouldn't keep blooming. These, this is a late September picture of celosia first flame red. We've got first flame yellow. Um, and then we have Arabona Red. Great cut flowers as well, and they do make dried flowers because in that bucket along with the Granvia Gold were some of these plumes as well. And they faded a little bit, but they still looked good. But if you put a mass planting of these together, it is really attractive to the eye. It attracts a lot of attention. And they get around a foot, foot and a half by the top of the bloom and about a foot wide. There is late October before we got a hard freeze. I don't know, was it last year or two years ago before we got, it was last year, before we got that freeze in October. And they still look pretty decent without any deadheading. Okay, so coleus, again, um, I've been around, like you said, for a lot of years. I remember uh, the wizard series when they were really small, um, not that big, but they were, they were nice, grown in the shade. Some of the coleus breeding has been phenomenal. This is one that came out last year, the Color Blaze series. Uh, Newly Noir, Albrido, Torchlight, they're big. They're really big. They're like three, two and a half, three foot tall by two and a half, three foot wide. We grow these in shade, and this is under a shade cloth on campus, and we grow them in full sun. And that color is really bold 
and not faded like sometimes they do when they get a hot sun on them. And they tolerate a lot of heat. And one of the things that we are doing or the breeders are doing in terms of coleus, they're looking for the coleus varieties that don't have blooms early in the season. So if you remember some of the old varieties of coleus, a lot of people, I can remember that question years ago, they'd like, do I deadhead these? Do I take the flowers off? The flowers basically are really inconsequential for the plants. You can see some of them right here, uh, but they just sometimes look a little raggedy. So a lot of people will go in and will deadhead them. So they look nice, so they look maintained. But I will tell you this, uh, the coleus flowers are very attractive to pollinators. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about pollinators here shortly. Um, so coleus flowers are attractive, but what the breeders are looking at, they're wanting to find those coleus varieties that don't have flowers, that don't have to be deadhead, or if they flower, they flower really late into the season so you don't have to worry about uh, the straggly look. This is another series, same, same, same series, color blaze, but this is pineapple brandy, cherry, and apple brandy. Um, very short very compact, one and a half by one and a half, a nice rounded mound. Now one of the things when you're designing with coleus, something that's really important is if you really want coleus to look good, they need something to go with them. Very rarely, unless you use this one maybe by itself or these two together, are you gonna get a, a planting that is attractive? That, that dark torchlight, it needs something with it. Pink petunias, pink uh, celosia or something. Something that brings the colors out. So they do need something to go along with them. This is in the shade. You're going to get different appearances in the shade. Any plant that grows in sun and shade, when it's in the sun, it's going to be shorter, compact, inner nodes. Um, the, the foliage is going to kind of turn in a little bit more compact because it's trying to preserve sun space or, or you know, that, that space that's open to the sun. And it's just going to be a little bit different in terms of a more of a faded color. Whereas you put them in the shade, this is the same one as the yellow one in the previous picture. You put them in the shade and they're a richer color. They get a little taller and a little more lush in appearance. Um, but they still will do well in sun or shade. And you can see in this particular picture, this variety has flowered, these two haven't yet. So when they come to our trials and start evaluating these, they're looking at that whole concept of, you know, when do they start blooming, when are they showing flowers. This is another one, same one in the, in the sun, full sun. So that's what it looks like if they're going to be putting them in sun or shade. Oh man, did anybody see these last year on the market? Anybody try these? These are incredible. If you want a bold, bold planting, particularly like in large containers. These are beautiful. This is two different calicaceas. This is heart of the jungle. And if you look at the foliage, great big foliage, two foot long. It looks like a heart shape. And this one's coffee cups where the foliage just kind of turns up just like a coffee cup. It will hold water if you're watering or irrigating or raining, and then it'll eventually drop that water out. The other thing about this particular plant, You've got both of these plants, rather. You have dark burgundy stems, really nice red stems. And then the veination and coffee cups is visible underneath there. So it's really, really a striking plant. Um, if you're going to use this, you will notice that it spreads prolifically in the ground. So you will get runners. You'll get extra plants to share with your neighbors. But if you're going to use this in a container, make sure it's a large container. I don't know if you have large containers around town, but they need really big containers. And they're also not going to do well if it's a windy area. So if you have a windy area, a deck or something where the wind just, you know, beats it up, that's not going to work either. They are a bulb. They form that bulb. So you can dig that bulb up just like your other summer flowering bulbs and bring them in and store them over the winter. These have been around a while. Have you guys used these in terms of the city, the, any of your containers or any locations? The Tut series has been around for a while and it still is a great structural plant. It gives you really good architecture to containers. Now here's the difference between the two trialing sites. So we water in Columbus. We rarely water, but we water in Springfield, so not as much. So in Columbus, King Tut is going to be six feet tall. In Springfield, it's going to be three feet tall. Baby Tut will be a foot tall in Springfield. With lots of water, it'll be three foot tall. These plants love water. In fact, you could put them down in a container and drop them in your water garden. They love water that much. So if you're going to have these, you can control the, the size of them by how much you water. Now, King Tut can get really big. Uh, this is King Tut on the right, three, three and a half feet tall. 
Prince Tut is a new one that came out that looks like King Tut but is much shorter. So for a backyard gardener or a smaller container, it does a good job. But I will tell you this, this is in our trials a few years back, about a foot, foot and a half tall. I had them in containers and of course with containers you know you water more often. So in a container with more water, it was almost two and a half to three feet tall. It was quite big, but it was a great structure in the garden. It gives you that really nice upright, really nice centerpiece type plant. And here it is in a four foot tall container with the uh, foliage, uh, the foliage around the side is sweet potato vine. So there are really good places to use it it's if you want something that's very structurally or architecturally sound. Dianthus. So if you've grown dianthus, and this, this picture, I just can't seem to get the picture right. It's just a tough one to take. If you grow dianthus, sweet William, you know that it blooms in the spring, kind of shuts down, maybe recedes, maybe comes back. This one is an interspecific, means two different species were crossed. This thing bloomed all summer long, and it bloomed clear up until hard frost. So this, I think, is a really new dianthus that's going to take the market by storm because it lasted all summer with these just really vivid purple flowers. It's about a foot tall. Now I'm anxious to see if it's going to reseed and if we're going to get the parent plant or if we're going to get the interspecific again. So we'll see what happens. This is called jolt. And there's jolt when it was in Springfield as well. I mean, just incredible color once it started blooming in first of July it just went all summer long so it was really quite attractive and there it is uh, in Columbus as well. Euphorbias have been around a while uh, people have used these for a variety of different ways different methods they've been around different varieties have been around I mean over the years you see different cultivars available they keep breeding the one thing that you you should understand is just because they come out with something good doesn't mean it lasts a long time they'll come out with something better eventually. Remember the old wave petunia, purple wave, came out, it was pretty, it was cool, it took, you know, everybody loved it, it just grew like crazy. It grew really big, 12 foot in a summer, I mean, it was huge. Well, that, now there's a new purple wave improved. So they will improve upon those genetics if there's something that can be made better. So um, euphorbias, they've worked on them over, over the years. This is one called Diamond Delight, loaded with flowers compared to the first ones that came out many years ago full sun, but we have also found these do quite well in shade. That is 70% shade cloth and it's in full bloom. So if you have a shade container, a shade garden, this is going to add that pop of white that you need. The problem in shade is we don't have a whole lot of color to grow with or to show in shades. You know, we've got some begonias and coleus, but we don't have a lot of color that just says, wow, look at me. So something white like this will attract the eye rather to that shady spot. Diamond Mountain came out three or four years ago, and that's this one right here. The problem we found with some of the other ones, Diamond Delight and some of the other ones, the real early ones, was that um, they didn't compete well in containers. You'd put it in a container and it kind of gets squelched out by everything else. They might grow and kind of interweave in and around, but they just wouldn't look, you just wouldn't get the white that you want. So Proven Winners came out with Diamond Mountain. Very vigorous, very bold, a nice grower. It's about two, two and a half foot tall. And by the way, euphorbias are very attractive to pollinators. They do like this plant. It's usually the little wasps and some of our native bees come to these plants. And here's Diamond Mountain with some of those large coleus. And we were really impressed because it did. If you look at that, it really filled in nicely and added some color to that area. So Diamond Mountain is a good one if you want a little bit more vigor. And then Diamond Snow under an, a Norway maple tree. So if you want some white, these euphorbias, in fact, that summer, because it was a little bit wetter, that summer it actually did well, did better in the shade than it did in the sun. And here, here it is another year in the sun. So lots of great color. You know, there's still some places that sell some of the old stuff. If they're not staying up with the times, they're missing out because there's some really good new stuff out there. This goes back, there's an old Evolvula, it's been around for a long time, but these are new cultivars called Blue My Mine and Blue My Mine XL. And it is probably one of the truest blue flowers next to some of the other salvias that we have on the market. And it just basically blooms right up the stem. No deadheading needed on this plant. It's excellent in a uh, full sun area. Now when Blue My Mine came out, we love that. Blue My Mind XL looks the same. It's like, okay, what is the difference? has to be different because it's two different names. And they told us that Blue My Mind X, XXL 
is a little more vigorous. It didn't really show that much in our trials. It almost looked the same. So I don't know if Blue My Mind X, double XL will probably make it or stay on the market based on its growth. Gomfrina. Some of you may remember strawberry fields, purple globes, the old ones that had short stems, small flowers that probably the size of my little finger. These are incredible. These are quarter size. This one is one called Fireworks. Um, this is Truffula Pink that came out. Gomfrina are fabulous for pollinators. You know, everybody's talking about pollinators and attracting pollinators. Excellent plant for pollinators. Uh, Truffula Pink was about two foot tall and it just kind of has long stems that just kind of blow in the wind. So it gives you another dimension to your garden, that movement or that motion in the garden. And butterflies love it and hummingbird moths also love it. Now I thought I would try something that would be really pretty together. I would put Truffula Pink and Diamond Mountain Euphorbia in a container. And my vision was that Diamond Mountain Euphorbia would be growing and the pink little pops of Truffula Pink would come through and it'd be just this beautiful ephemeral, you know, pink and white cloud. Well, Diamond Mountain, because it is so vigorous, I had to cut the Truffula Pink back three times in order to get it at least above the Diamond Mountain so it could start to grow and start to bloom. It eventually was pretty, but it, it didn't quite meet my vision of that, you know, really beautiful pink and white cloud. This one, though, this is fantastic. Ball, or this is a cicada introduction called uh, Ping Pong. It's Gonfrina Ping Pong, purple flowers. This is an August, late August picture without deadheading. So they keep blooming right up the flower. They start real tiny and they just keep blooming and get you know, a little bit bigger. But they have these nice little purple balls on about a foot by a foot plant. Um, they bloom all summer. And one of my volunteers, she's a librarian, and she said, I love this plant because it reminds me of a Dr. Seuss plant. All these little purple balls all over. It's just a really cute plant. Okay, another great one. Now this is where we get into the pollinator situation. So this is Helianthus, it's a sunflower, okay? And sunflowers, as we know, are great for the pollinators, bees, hummingbirds, I mean, all the different pollinators come to them. And if you cut sunflowers and bring them in the house and put them on your kitchen table in a vase, what do you have the next morning on the table? A circle of pollen. And, and for some reason, I don't know how they do it, but it's just a perfect circle of pollen that drops off on the sunflowers. So proven winners came up with this sterile sunflower called Syncredible Yellow. It's three foot tall. It is vigorous. You get these kinds of blooms all season long. Longer stems on them, so they are developed to be a cut flower. So that cut flower growers could use these and people then don't have that pollen that you know, falls on the table. So because they're sterile, pollinators don't get anything from them yet they're still attractive to pollinators. And I had a volunteer kind of point that out last year when we were planting. He's like, well, you know, they may not feed pollinators, but they attract them. And if they attract them to the garden, because pollinators look for those yellow colors, at least they'll get into the garden and then look for the other plants that you have around there. I thought, you know, that makes sense. I'll, I'll, I'll go with that, Mark. That sounds really good. This is what it looks like when you first plant it. And this is how bold, this is in, uh, I think I planted them in um, the last week in May, and this is what they look like by midsummer. Now this one is a different cultivar called Saturn. And you can see the incredible, Suncredibles in the back. Saturn has these nice little kind of maroonish color tips on the flowers, and it has this really dark red stem. Almost the same height, almost the same appearance, but just a different color to it. And again, Excellent cut flowers, multi-branch, multi-stem, because if you have sunflowers, you know, the big ones, teddy bear and all those, they bloom once and then they're done. These bloom all summer long. So even though they are sterile, they were bred for a certain purpose. So my mantra, my, my recommendations on pollinators is just plant something. Even if you plant this, plant something else that is attractive to the pollinators, because some of these plants were bred for certain and specific reasons, and they're good plants. They're still good plants. This is an excellent plant for pollinators, butterflies particularly. Uh, Heliotropium, this is August lavender, has a really nice fragrance to it. It's not real strong, but it has a nice slight fragrance to it. And again, it blooms right up that stem. The flowers just keep on going all summer. It's about a foot tall by about a foot wide. Nice light lavender color that again is very attractive to pollinators. And you can see it's, it's just 
starts right here and just keeps right on blooming up the stem. Um, I had it in the garden. It's just a nice filler plant, excellent filler for containers. Impatience. Okay, so impatience a few years ago, you probably heard of a disease called um, impatience downy mildew. And it was a problem. It was a problem on plugs that came in from South America. The disease was shipped in on the plugs. Growers didn't know it at the time. It got introduced into the landscape through bedding plant sales and so forth. And then it started showing up in the landscape. And it was a big concern. It actually devastated the impatience market because what, what does everybody plant in the shade, right? Impatience is the only thing we plant in the shade pretty much. So it really devastated practically the number one plant in the greenhouse industry. So a couple of the companies, and this is one from Ball, went to work and tried to develop impatient downy mildew resistant plants. And the Beacon series is indeed resistant to downy mildew. So if we do have it, um, you won't get it. However, along the way, we have learned uh, since we did get downy mildew, we have since learned that impatient downy mildew does not overwinter in the landscape in Ohio. So if you had it, you had impatience that just like dropped their leaves, looked horrible by midsummer. It did not overwinter in the landscape. And also at the greenhouse level, when these impatience come in from South America, they are treated with fungicides to ensure that they are not going to carry impatient downy mildew into the landscape. So you can be pretty sure that you're not going to have it unless some anomaly comes up and we get them in again and somebody forgot to spray. Um, so the Beacon series is resistant, but the Impatience, the Wallerianas, all the other ones that you used to buy, those are all available again, and you can be pretty confident to use those in the landscape. The Impatience, like I said, excellent for shade. Um, the more water you give them, the bigger they're going to get. So if you want to keep them nice and compact, less water, they'll stay about a foot. On campus, they got about two foot tall. In Clark County, they only got about a foot. Now, the hybrid impatience, whenever you see X, that means it's a hybrid. The hybrid impatience, like the sun patients, uh, the New Guinea impatients, those are resistant to downy mildew. So a lot of people started planting these instead of the sun pa or the um, uh, impatience because they are resistant to downy mildew. We, um, when I first started my career in a garden center, we got uh, impatients, New Guinea impatients, and you know everybody told us, "Oh, these are great. You got to grow them in full sun. They're they're perfect." Well, if you've done that, we know that they don't take full hot sun unless you give them a lot of water. They've got to have water if you're going to put them in full sun. The sun patients and all the ones that say they grow in the sun, you actually have to put them like in the morning sun. Or if you're going to put them in the late afternoon hot sun, you're going to have to water them more often. They're beautiful plants, and they're very resistant to just about anything. Yeah, Japanese beetles don't even like them. So on the left, we have the vigorous series and the compact, or I'm sorry, the vigorous here, and on the left is the compact series. They have varieties of foliage, variegated foliage, so they give you lots of color. Um, and again, they're excellent for containers, excellent in a landscape planting as well. And this is your New Guinea, a lot of different varieties of New Guinea. But I will say, lately we haven't had a whole lot of New Guinean patients. They're coming out more and more with ones they're calling uh, sun patients. And we got another new series this year that's meant for the sun. Uh, but again, if we put in the sun, it's just not going to look as good as it should if it were planted in the shade or given lots of water. Sweet potato vine, one of those plants that just grow like crazy, gets really big. Uh, all different cultivars, and it seems like every three, four years we'll get a bunch of cultivars, new cultivars of sweet potato vine, because again, they continually breed these plants for better and better and better aesthetics. Um, you have your Chillin' series, your DeSanta, your Illusion, your Sweet Caroline. You have all these different series. They all grow vigorously. They all look beautiful in full sun, but they all are very big, bold plants. So if you put them in a 12 inch, 24 inch container with other plants, they will take over and they will just crush out everything else. You can eat the sweet potatoes. I mean, they, they don't look pretty, but they taste just fine if you bake them. Um, and they just, they're just big, they're just big and bold. A Couple years ago, I think this is two years ago, we had two in our trials. This is Illusion Emerald Lace. And I really like this one because of the extremely deep cut sinuses on the foliage. So it gives you a little more texture in the landscape or in the planting. And the other one that was extremely impressive was Sweet Caroline Raven. This was at the end of the season. 
and it was only about, in, in its entirety, it was only about two and a half to three foot wide. A little more behaved, a little, little less of a bully, but a beautiful dark color, dark burgundy, not quite the deep sinuses that you see in Emerald Illusion, but a very nice plant. Um, they are susceptible to golden tortoise beetle. If you start seeing holes in your sweet potato vines, it's not necessarily slugs. Look for the insect before you start doing any kind of pest control. Golden tortoise beetles are just that, they're golden, but they come out at night and they put holes, feed on the plants, put holes in them, and they overwinter in the soil. So take a look for those if you start seeing holes in and don't just start treating for slugs without identifying what's going on. The lantanas, the series of lantanas, this last year must have been the year of the lantana because they really sent us quite a few. They're much more compact and that's one of the things that we're noticing in a lot of our trial plants that are coming in. They're breeding for compactness. They're breeding for urban gardeners, for backyard gardeners with small spaces. Um, they're not the big three and four foot lantanas that we used to have with the old Patriot series. So they're much more um, compact, very floriferous, lots of flowers all summer. And if I had to tell you my top three pollinator plants, I would say lantana is one of those, verbena is another one, and salvia is the other one. Those three plants are extremely attractive to pollinators. Butterflies, hummingbird moths, hummingbirds, bees, wasps, just about anything you can think of are attracted to these plants. This is one called Royal Cosmo that I just, I absolutely loved because it starts out with this really beautiful pink bloom and then it opens to yellow and then as it ages, it fades to this kind of a peachy pink. So it's got all these colors on one plant, so it makes a really nice planting. Um, another one was Luscious Marmalade. And then we had the Shamrock series last year. And quite honestly, I mean, you see all of these together, different series, they all pretty much had this same compact, rounded, mounded plant. Foot, foot and a half, two foot at the max but loaded with flowers. So shamrock, orange, peach, rose, and white. Uh, Bloomify was a little bit bigger, not much, but just a little bit bigger. Again, a good reason for you to come to Springfield and look at the trials or go to Columbus and look at the trials so you can see plants side by side, see how they perform, see what they do in the summer months. And then as you see all the different cultivars, this was in Columbus, all the different series that we had in Lantana. So there's lots of cool Lantanas out. Um, they're all good. The only insect problem that you might have with lantana would be white fly. Typically we don't see that in landscape and even if you do it's not that big of a deal, doesn't bother the plant. Just don't take the plants into the greenhouse if they have white fly or you will have white fly forever. Lantanas don't like it cold and they don't like it wet. A couple, two, three, um, how many years ago we had a July that we got down uh, like low 60s at night and it was very damp. They will shut down in terms of blooming. So they are the, what I call, parking lot plants. They prefer that cement, hot concrete where it's really hot and dry, no water in that parking lot area. They will do great in that kind of setting, but they don't like to have cool, damp nights. Uh, basils. So this was a cool one that came in last year. This is called Thai Towers, and this is midsummer. And man, I'm looking at this plant and I'm thinking, wow, that is just great. Look at the structure of that. How cool would that be to have like a, you know, a, a garden with that lined up as little soldiers or something? But the problem then later on in the season, as it got taller, and if you don't use it, it just started splitting. And unfortunately, it kind of, you know, my, my evaluation at this time was five. Then it started splitting, it's like, okay, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be, but it's still a nice basil. Great fragrance, excellent taste, but also gives you that dimension of height in the garden. So a great container plant because, unlike us, you would be cutting it back and using it and keeping it nice and compact as opposed to getting too tall and split. Ornamental grasses, or ornamental millet rather, ornamental millet. They're out there. If you see them, use them. Try them out, particularly in a large commercial planting or a planting where you might have in the city that has a, a big area you want to fill in. This is one called Jester. The blooms are these uh, reddish flowers. The foliage is dark red. Just a very bold plant, bold color in the landscape. And then there are several different types that you could use as well. Same thing with ornamental peppers. Now, ornamental peppers are a real challenge to sell in the greenhouse or the garden center. Nobody goes in the spring to buy ornamental peppers. They go in to buy peppers that you eat. So unless they're these black foliage ones, like black pearl, that has great black and red peppers on it later in the season, or black olive, 
you're not likely to pick this up as a plant. If you grow them by seed, you can put them in the ground and then by July you'll have beautiful coloration, but they're just not something people look for in a garden center. So typically you're gonna find them either as a fall plant or find them in seed catalogs and grow them from seed. We've been evaluating them over the years and my favorite of all times is this New Mex Twilight. It is a seed grown. It's about two foot wide with all these different layers, about a foot high, different um, size or different colors of peppers, which starts out this yellowish color, fades to red and purple, and they all just look like little Christmas lights on a plant. So it's one of my favorites. And you know, for a fall, it gives you that additional fall color up until a hard frost. So if you're gonna grow ornamental peppers, you can look for them in the garden centers, but you may not find them, but you certainly can grow them from seed easily. And this is one called uh, Onyx Red, but again, people just aren't picking these up in the spring. There are several ornamental grasses. Now, these are annuals, zone seven, zone eight. They will not overwinter in our landscape. I don't care what you try to do. They look awful in the winter months. The seed heads shatter when we get a first frost, so they don't even look good over the winter standing in the garden. Uh, but they're very cool and they're very fast growing. Fireworks can get up to three and a half, four feet tall and blooms all summer. Uh, has that nice dark burgundy red color. Skyrocket, short, compact, about two foot. We have not seen this one reseed. The annuals have not been reseeding that we know of. Vertigo on the left there starts out like this and ends up like this at the end of the summer. Again, like your millet and some of your tall, bold plants. An excellent plant with about an inch wide foliage. It does not get bloomed, so it's a great foliage plant for the landscape. I've never really been a big fan of Pentas until these came out in the last couple years. And the problem I, I have had with them is that they just aren't prolific with flowers. They're pretty, they're perfect for butterflies and hummingbirds because they have this really pretty tubular flower. But in the past, the Pentas cultivars, I just didn't see a lot of blooms on them. This Sunstar series, this is Sunstar Rose, Sunstar Pink lots of flowers. So I've kind of, I was kind of taken by them the year we had them because they were covered with flowers compared to some of the older varieties. Nice compact plant. If you want butterflies, this is probably the top one on the list for butterflies. It's really an excellent attractor. All right, petunias. 55 mile an hour plants. You can put them in just about anywhere and people driving on the highway, they're gonna see them because they're just incredible colors. Incredible ease to take care of them. The new ones that are vegetative cuttings, no deadheading. We don't deadhead any of these, both on campus and in Springfield. Uh, this is Springfield, this is campus. They look fantastic all season long. Here's your challenge as a consumer. What should you buy? Which ones do you buy? They're all different sizes, shapes, growth habits. It's really kind of a challenge to decide what you want. And again, the trials can help you with that. Um, in addition, make sure you know what you're looking for. Do you want something that's spreading? Do you want something that's compact? Do you want a hanging basket petunia? There's all different types of petunias on the market. And a lot of times it depends on what the grower likes in terms of growing in the greenhouse, not always what the consumer likes, because sometimes they grow better in the greenhouse uh, as opposed to the landscape. This is the Serfinia series. Serfinia is a Suntory introduction, very, very similar to your waves and to your um, supertunias. So all the companies have their kind of nice spreading petunia and this is Serfinia. This one was really cool because typically with variegated ones or with multicolors, we don't see a lot of vigor, but this was purple heart and you can see the heart shape on the petals. Um, it was quite vigorous. There's six plants there and they put on a load of color last year. Same thing with heart being improved, a little lighter pink. Reds don't always look that good in petunias, or in the past they didn't, but they've done a lot of work on the red ones, and this is one called Trailing Red that's been fantastic. Last year it looked, it looked really good in the gardens. Purple Starshine, Vista Bubblegum is kind of the standards that I think almost every city at one time or another has used for a downtown container or hanging basket. Have you guys used them? Centerville, no? Okay, good. You're one of the ones that haven't because everybody found them and just overused them actually. Uh, this is Vista Bubblegum in 70% shade. Somebody needs to say, wow. That's a petunia in shade, folks. Petunias don't like shade, right? They like sun. Well, again, with these new genetics, 
don't hesitate to try one or two in the shade and see how they do. They're supposed to do well in sun, but look at this. I mean, 70% shade, I'll take that for a shady area where you don't have a lot of color. So don't hesitate to try one or two. I'm not telling you to go out and buy $100 worth or anything. Just try one or two and see how they do in the shade. This is probably one of my favorite whites because in, in my opinion, it's probably one of the purest whites that I've seen in terms of petunias, Vista Snowdrift. Nice shot of it. Mini Vista White, smaller, more compact. Again, we're not looking at the six foot, seven foot spreaders. We're looking at those that are more compact, more well behaved. Vista Jazzberry was in last year. I think this is probably gonna be a popular one in the future, kind of a purple color. It was very popular. Supertunia Sharon. Color Rush Pink is the ball series for spreading. Color Rush is nice. Burgundy Velvet, Easy Wave, Easy Wave Sky Blue, Easy Wave Blue, Double Wave Pink, Cannonball Merlot was another good one last year. I mean, I know a lot of people, you know, and I said with petunias they smell and they're stinky. I know a lot of people don't like petunias, but I'm telling you, you cannot go wrong. We don't deadhead these either place, and they just give you that massive color all season long. Cannonball White and Burgundy. This was a really popular series last year. Um, Purple Dawn, Yellow Sun, and Orange Sun. And this Orange Sun was just a really cool color. I mean, it was just a kind of a sunset type color. It, just, it was really beautiful. And there's a close-up shot of those. Um, Picasso, pretty much Picasso. Picasso in pink. Pretty petunias, more of a boutique type petunia. I call them boutique types because they aren't as vigorous, but they're really cool. Look at that purple flower, pink tips, um, just different colorations, Picasso and purple, just something that's gonna be a little more like suitable for a container, or a hanging basket, something that's close to the house that people are gonna see and appreciate because it's not gonna be seen quite a bit in the distance. This is a, an annual Rebecca, although I really wish it was perennial, but it does not come back. Rebecca herda, when you see that, that is the annual mini Becky flame. This is what it looks like during the summer. This is what it looks like in the fall. And once it starts blooming, it's about a foot tall and it just, it stays that way all summer long. Kind of fades to more of a, an orangish color in the fall, which is perfect for fall colors and is great for pollinators, but it's a really nice annual Rebecca. And there it is on campus as well. Very pretty colors. And I think, yeah, we did deadhead on campus. Um, this was one on campus, and this was the one in Springfield. And I think we did deadhead the ones, but again, you really don't have to. All right, salvias. Excellent plants for pollinators. This is salvia playing the blues. This is a takeoff of the old salvia Victoria blue that we used to have years ago. Unplug so blue. If you want a pollinator plant that attracts a wide variety of pollinators, this one was amazing. Last year during the summer, uh, and I have some videos, although they're cell phone videos, so they're not very good, um, the number of pollinator species on this plant was amazing. I mean, it's just, you could stand there and see bumblebees, um, carpenter bees, honeybees, butterflies. There's a, a carpenter bee right there, all over this plant, just a wide variety of species. Right next to it was Unplugged So Pink. It only had carpenter bees on it. It only was attractive to one variety. So uh, we are working with Dr. Mary Gardner on campus and the Cincinnati Zoo and about nine counties across the state and we're going to do perennial plants for cultivars. We're gonna do some research projects on them. But Mary was excited to learn about the potential for evaluating these annual cultivars because they're there on campus, they're in Springfield, and the Cincinnati Zoo is gonna have the same things planted. So we have three replications, and their, her grad students are gonna look at our annual cultivars and evaluate how attractive they are to other species because the mantra now is plant native plants, right? Only native plants are gonna help the pollinators. Well, that's not true. That's not true, and if you read my column, you've probably heard me talk about that. And I, I'm sure if you read my column, you heard me last week about no mo may, which, I mean, how crazy is that? No mo may, would you guys let people go without mowing their grass the whole month of May? No. Can you imagine how tall it's gonna be at the end of May? And the whole concept was allow dandelions to grow. Well, my, my mantra is no spray may. Just don't spray your dandelions until they go to bloom. Let the pollinators feed on them. 
My whole point with pollinators is plant something. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be all native plants. If you have a landscape, incorporate some native plants if you can. But you also have quite a few of our cultivated plants that are equally as good. And how do we know that these might not even be better? The research hasn't been done to say maybe the pollen in these plants is better than our native plants. We don't know that. So at this point in time, until we do know these things, just plant something that is attractive to your pollinators. But again, again, unplugged pink was not as attractive to pollinators. Big blue, monarch butterfly. Salvia black and blue is a great one. Black and bloom, deep purple, rock and deep purple. You can see a big old carpenter bee right there. Now they are pollen robbers or nectar robbers. They're too big, their butts don't fit down these little tiny blooms right there. So they go to the side to this black calyx right here and they drill a little hole and rob the pollen that way. Um, so they do, they are attractive to these and honeybees love them as well. Rock and fuchsia, just really cool plants and just great for pollinators. Scaviola, I never really used to like this plant. I was never really impressed with it. Um, this is the whirlwind blue, what it used to look like years ago. And this shows a great example of the improvement, whirlwind blue improved, this improvement in the number of flowers. If you look at these fans, they were like halfway. Now we've got flowers all the way around. So I, I now am impressed with scavola. It's a great plant, whirlwind blue improved, whirlwind white improved. It's known as fan flower, and you can see that little fan-shaped foliage. Excellent texture in the landscape. This is a new one called Cerdiva. A little bit smaller flowers, but it's got those really nice petals that give you some texture in the landscape. Sardiva fashion, pink and white. Nice for the landscape. Full sun also. And then as I mentioned, your verbenas are great for pollinators. I see more hummingbird moss on these things than I see of anything. This is Endurascape pink bicolor, Scarlet Star, Imperial Blue. There's been a lot of great breeding done in verbenas, so the colors are good, the colors are sturdy. They're only going to be about two foot wide by about a foot tall. They're great for containers and hanging baskets, and they can be ground cover plants as well. Uh, one year when we had all these different colors available, one year, that same year that the lantana stopped blooming, when it got cool and damp. They do not like cool, damp weather, so they stopped blooming. They are also that parking lot plant. A new one that was in the trials last year, Verbena bonariensis. There's a species, Verbena bonariensis, that is amazing for butterflies and other pollinators. Two to three foot tall, just kind of blows in the wind, so it gives you movement in the garden. This one is much shorter. It's about a foot, a little more compact. Um, I don't know if it's going to recede like the uh, species does. Um, I'm kind of hoping it does, but it won't be short and compact like this because this is, is again, this is a cultivar. And if it recedes, it's probably going to give me the real tall ones again. I let them come up every year within my flower beds because they have height to them and they're just perfect for pollinators to come to the garden. Catharanthus, it used to be Vinca, so it was supposed to be at the end of this. V, we're not starting back over at C's. But they changed the genus name, and this is what people do, the taxonomists, they like to change names, so you never know what's going to come out the next year. Um, moms are not chrysanthemums anymore, they're dendranthemums. Uh, this is Vinca, your old Vinca. Vinca is an outstanding plant, but we have trouble with them in the landscape. And the reason is they can't tolerate cold, wet soils. They will get Phytophthora root rot if it's cold and it's wet. And all the years since 1998 that I've been trialing, we've only had one problem year. And that was the year, several years ago, that we had 30 days of rain in June and the temperatures were cool. Cool, damp soils, they will get Phytophthora root rot. They turn yellow, and then they just kind of fade away. They, they, they rot out. So if you plant them too early in Ohio, particularly in our area, if you plant them in early May and the soils are cold and they stay damp, I can guarantee Phytophthora root rot. If you wait until towards the end of May, like we do with our trials, we've never had trouble with them other than that year where the environmental conditions were perfect. So it's a great plant, no insect or, or other pest problems, no diseases. Maybe once I've seen Japanese beetles on them, but they don't damage them to the point where they look bad. About a foot tall, there are the Mediterranean varieties that are uh, trailers. This is a cool one. This is called Soiree Kawaii. These flowers are about a dime size where all your other vancas are about a quarter size. So they're a little smaller, but again, they give you that texture in the garden and they give you lots of them. 
And last year we had peppermint white, red, coral reef, and blueberry kiss. Really nice compact six to eight inch plant, only about four to six inches in height. And then the Cora Cascade and the Mediterranean, which are the trailing plants. One final on zinnias. There's a couple different zinnia cultivars. Zinnia Perfusion has been out, the Perfusion series has been out for a while. It is the proven winner's plant. Ball has the Cicada, or the um, Zahara series, Zahara. The Perfusion are smaller flowers, lot, not as, or lot, smaller flowers, lots of them. Zahara is larger flowers, not as many of them. But overall, they both give you the same wow factor in the garden. And zinnias are also up there in terms of pollinators. Butterflies love zinnias. Very few problems with them. You have perfusion, double red, double fire. This is a, an All-American Selection winner from I think it was two years ago. And everybody that visited our gardens just raved about this plant. This is red and yellow bicolor. This is pretty much what it looks like early on when it starts blooming. This is like midsummer. Uh, yeah, here's what I want. This is in the fall. This plant will have yellow flowers at first that fade to kind of this pinkish or this, this pinkish red in the middle or pink in the middle, reddish, that fade to this all on the same plant. And by the time you get to like August into the fall, this is a, a September picture because you can see the mom on the right isn't quite blooming. Beautiful, all on one plant. Now I put this picture in here because last year we did have a little bit of splitting. And sometimes with the zinnias, if they get a little bit taller and you get a heavy rain, you might see some splitting with it, but it still looked good in the landscape. Okay, this is our website, go.osu.edu slash cultivar trials. And you can go there if you wanna find reports, um, information from last year, how all the plants did in the past and uh, also how to get to Snyder Park Gardens and Arboretum. So we urge you to come up for a visit, bring your pencil and paper, take a look at the plants. The first Saturday in August at nine o'clock till like around two o'clock, we have our Garden Jubilee where we have vendors, music, food, all kinds of stuff happening. The gardens are almost perfect. You might not find a weed or you might find one, but just don't tell us. Everything is really looking good for that particular day. So we invite you to come up for that. With that, I thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to the commission.